welcome to our weekly Saving Life on Earth webinar. I'm Tiara Curry. I'm a senior scientist in our Saving Life on Earth campaign. So thank you for joining us for our speaker series webinars to deep dive with our staff to learn more about the many ways that we're working to end extinction. In this webinar, we're going to talk about the work we're doing to gain protection for California mountain lions and other wildlife near California's urban areas. Wildlife populations from butterflies to bears are threatened by sprawl and dangerous road crossings. Back in January, when we released our Saving Life on Earth policy plan, that was actions that people in the United States and leaders, the president and Congress need to take to end extinction. In this country, we called for the creation of a thousand new wildlife underpasses and overpasses to help wildlife move around safely. This evening, we're gonna to talk to two experts from our urban wildlands program who focus on fighting small and getting habitats reconnected. Tomorrow, they're gonna to be on Slack from noon to one Pacific if you wanna continue the conversation with them. We're gonna save 20 minutes for questions and answers at the end of this webinar. And after the webinar, you're gonna get an email with an action that you can take to help. So while we're talking about big cats, I wanna show you this beautiful painting, there's an artist and center supporter named Angela Mano, and she made this beautiful painting of a Florida panther. Okay, my screen sharing. This one, here it is. Um, share screen. All right, there we go. <laughs> she paints these beautiful endangered species paintings and this is just one of them. The Florida panther is another big cat that's threatened by urban sprawl and population disconnection. You can check out this and her other artwork at angelamano.com. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to our speakers to introduce themselves. Tiffany, you wanna go first? Sure. Yeah, hi everyone. And thank you all for joining us um, today. I'm excited to be here and thanks Tiara for having us. Um, my name is Tiffany App. I'm a senior scientist at the Center for Biological Diversity, and I'm um, in the Urban Wildlands Program. And um, I guess in terms of who I am, I've always had a love and curiosity for the natural world, and I've spent a lot of time either enjoying it or studying it or both. And so um, I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about wildlife connectivity and mountain lions and our work to protect um, species and habitats. Do you want to tell us just real quickly what you're doing in those pictures? Sure. Yeah. So um, the first picture with the fish, I, that's a yellowtail rockfish. And I was I used to work with at CDFW and we would measure the fish that um, anglers would come home with, but either on their boats or from onshore. And so I'm just measuring the weight of, of that rockfish right there. Um, and then I'm in the middle picture, I'm measuring barnacle. Um, recruitment um, on the rocks and that rocky intertidal surface. So that's really low tide, which is why I can be lying down there and not be totally soaked. Um, and then in that other picture, um, it's, it's at night, we went and did some surveys to look at, at different salamanders in, um, up in uh, Mill Valley. And that's a giant California salamander, um, that adult that I'm, that I'm holding there. Isn't she cool? This is going to be an awesome webinar. <laughs> Those are awesome life experiences. Thanks, Tia. All right, let's meet our other panelist, JP. You might remember him from his awesome cooking demonstrations earlier this spring. Hey, everybody. So happy to be here. My name is JP Rose. Um, I'm an attorney at the Center in Los Angeles in the Urban Wildlands Program, so I work closely with Tiffany. Um, I just included here a couple pictures of places I love. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you have Zion Canyon, um, and then below that, the Domeland Wilderness in the southern Sierra Nevada, and then uh, Joshua Tree National Park on New Year's Day right after a snowstorm. So really excited to chat with you today, and thanks for coming. All right. So, Tiffany, the Urban Wildlands Program works to help save wildlife in the Urban Wildland Interface. What, does, what is the Urban Wildland Interface, and why is it important? Yeah, well, so the urban wildland interface is the transition zone between human development and undeveloped wildlands. Um, so it's places that people might think about from their childhood when they spent time in nature, if they had access to it. Uh, maybe the creek behind their house or a field they ran through by their school or a nearby park where they would take family walks. Um, so it's often where people have their first interaction with nature. 
And it's critically important for maintaining um, healthy communities and healthy ecosystems. And so here are just a couple of photos to help visualize what that means. Um, these were taken by a great wildlife photographer, um, Joanna Turner. And this is a, these, these are both from the LA area. Um, and so, you know, sometimes there are these sharp lines between cities and wilderness, but most of the time it's a very gradual transition. And it's in this area where people and wildlife share and affect the same space. And it's where many sensitive animals and plants can and do exist. Um, so species like the California red legged frog, um, you know, chucker spot butterfly, tricolored blackbirds, mountain lions. And these are all species that the center has worked really hard to protect. So I got to ask, why focus on saving wildlife around urban areas? Why not? There's limited time, energy. Why not focus on more traditional habitats? Yeah, that's a great question. And well, the reality is wild animals don't know that they're supposed to adhere to the boundaries of our protected public lands. Um, some animals are going to move around to find food and water and mates, and that can bring them onto private lands and into areas that are closer to people. And those areas are often the most vulnerable to development and destruction. And so some places that we protect might not look particularly remarkable, like rental pools or even degraded agricultural lands, uh, but species, sensitive species still live there and they still use those areas. Um, they might contain important critical habitat for threatened or endangered species like California tiger salamanders or San Diego fairy shrimp. Um, and they provide habitat for millions of birds that migrate across our state. And so we focus on trying to protect those private lands that are actively being used by our most sensitive wildlife and our most vulnerable to development. You know, and so since roads are so pervasive with human development, I wanted to show you all a couple of examples of how roads and traffic can affect species in the urban wildland interface. Um, so next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so UC Davis um, has actually found that there are about 7,000 to 23,000 reported wildlife vehicle collisions in California every year with large mammals. And they estimate that that can cost up to $600 million in life lost, injuries, property damage. And what's important to know is that there's often under reporting, we've seen some of that five to 10 fold in these kinds of collisions. So the magnitude of this issue could be much greater. Um, there are also estimates that there are about 340 million birds killed on roads every year in the US. But with other critters like amphibians and reptiles and insects, we, we don't know as much. Next slide. Um, and so that's when community science can come in sometimes. So this is a really great iNaturalist community science project where um, locals were really concerned about their, new pop their local new population. And they found that um, in, in two years of surveys, so two, over two breeding seasons, they documented over 10,000 California newts killed on one stretch four mile stretch of road. And so, you know, I think these kinds of impacts really demonstrate that we need to modify our policies, our behaviors, and our infrastructure in the urban wildland interface so that we don't drive more species toward extinction. And instead we coexist with the awesome biodiversity that we have. That reminds me, like in Portland, there's a whole group of people who go out in January to move frogs across the road. And I think this actually happens around the country and it's terribly depressing. Mm -hmm. Like it's rewarding because you're like picking up a frog and moving it across the road, but it's also just like depressing and shows we need better solutions. Yeah, um, totally. Let's talk about the big cats. JP, tell us about your work to get state protection for mountain lions in California and, and why they need protection. Thanks, Tier. of course. Um, so yeah, just a little background first on why they need protection. Um, so Southern California and Central Coast mountain lions are facing a variety of threats. Um, pretty much all the major ones are listed here on the slide. Um, genetic isolation, vehicle strikes, depredation kills, rodenticides, um, climate change, wildfire. Um, and with vehicle strikes, that alone kills, I think, around 100 mountain lions per year in California. Around 100 more are killed by depredation kills um, when someone legally kills a mountain lion after, for instance, it attacks um, livestock or there's some sort of conflict. But I think what I'm going to focus most of the time today to talk about is just this genetic um, isolation issue. Um, and so um, highways and development are, have created barriers that have prevented mountain lions from dispersing, um, seeking new home ranges and new mates. 
And this has led to a dramatic decline in genetic diversity for Southern California and Central Coast populations. Um, and so this genetic isolation, along with all these other problems, is causing what scientists have um, termed an extinction vortex. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, and so, yeah, this is just a little uh, diagram that illustrates the uh, genetic isolation problem. Um, you see uh, on the left-hand side, the Santa Monica Mountains, that yellow area, um, it's pretty much all boxed in by um, development by the 101 freeway. Um, same goes for the uh, Santa Ana Mountains, which are a little bit farther to the right and south, or I guess southeast from there. Um, the I-15 freeway um, essentially um, blocks connectivity to the Eastern Peninsula ranges. And so you have this problem where decades in the making where um, development is done without concern for how it impacts connectivity, for how it impacts mountain lions. And um, this is causing a decline in genetic diversity for these populations. And um, this is a, a, a bit depressing, but I, I'll, I'll get less depressing very soon. Um, this is just a kind of very graphic um, evidence of the problem with these populations. They literally, um, some of them are having pink tails now because of the lack of genetic diversity. Um, and scientists are concerned that this is gonna lead to what's known as inbreeding depression, um, where the health of the species of the population continues to decline um, and can eventually lead to extinction of these populations. Um, next slide, please. So um, what came out in 2018 was a really interesting study um, that determined that there were 10 mountain lion populations throughout California. Um, and for our purposes, um, it became apparent that um, a subset of these populations were the ones that need protection. Um, and just to back up a little bit here, there are some very healthy mountain lion populations in California, for instance, the Sierra Nevada, um, there's not really any evidence that that population is in trouble right now. But what we were seeing in these studies um, is that the kind of the central coast region up and in including the Santa Cruz Mountains all the way down to Southern California, um, including like LA, Riverside, San Bernardino, those are the ones that need protection. And um, these form what's known as an evolutionarily significant unit or ESU. And the good news is that under California's landmark endangered species law, the California Endangered Species Act, you can protect um, a subset of a population, even if it's doing all right in other areas. And so um, what we did is petition to list these certain populations under the State Endangered Species Act. Um, and just a little more background on that. So um, we, we began this process in the spring of last year. Um, and we submitted the petition that um, Tiffany um, spent many, many hours drafting. I helped a little bit, but it was definitely Tiffany spent a lot of time researching this and we submitted it in um, June of 2019. And uh, a few months later, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife recommended that the petition move forward, which was fantastic. Um, and then in April, 2020, um, the, we received a unanimous a uh, vote from the California Fish and, Fish and Game Commission that um, confirmed what's known as candidacy status. So this means that these populations are protected now for the next year while um, the state continues to study the issue and will eventually make a final decision next year. But um, it was just, it was very exciting to see the engagement of center members in this process. Um, we organized a coalition of almost 100 groups to support the listing. And we're really excited to continue moving the process forward um, and get a permanent listing next year. And um, so, yeah, you may be wondering, well, what, what is CESA listing? What is the California Endangered Species Act? What does it do? Um, this is, in a nutshell, what it does. Um, it helps guide land use planning decisions. Um, so, for instance, uh, if a developer is proposing, say, a housing development or something, um, they would have to um, design the development in a way that it's not going to block connectivity for mountain lions. Um, the same goes for if Caltrans is trying to build or expand a freeway. For instance, they could put wildlife crossings into the freeway to ensure that mountain lions can continue to um, connect to other habitat areas. 
Um, so it can lead to greener infrastructure, wildlife bridges, um, the restoration of culverts and underpasses so that they're actually usable by wildlife. And some of those fixes are actually pretty easy. You can, for instance, install um, soundproofing on an underpass. You can add some native vegetation. And then it becomes a way that wildlife can move across the landscape. So these are all things that we're um, excited that the CESA listing will help put into place. And then finally, um, the state officials at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife can uh, put together what's known as a recovery plan. Um, and that is exactly what it sounds like, a plan for the species and the population to recover. Um, it includes information on population trends, uh, potential threats, and possible remediation and mitigation strategies. So um, as I mentioned, these steps are already starting to come into play because of the candidacy status of mountain lions. So they now have temporary protection and we're really excited to continue engaging with members and other organizations to get permanent protections next year for these big cats. So mountain lions have pretty big territories and they roam pretty widely. What role do they play in the environment and would protecting them help protect lots of other species like endemic land snails, let's say? <laughs> yes, um, definitely. Uh, and before I get a little more into that, um, and feel free to, to move the slide to you when you have a chance, um, thanks. Um, I, I just wanna like say my own view that mountain lions have intrinsic value. Um, you know, California used to be a place where grizzly bears roamed, where there were wolves, and we don't really have those anymore because of how we've, you know, treated the environment and wildlife. And I, I think mountain lions have a right to exist in California, and I'm so lucky to live in a state where these magnificent predators still roam, and I hope we can protect them for future generations of people, but also for their own sake. Um, but there are very practical reasons, too, why we should keep mountain lions on the landscape. Um, mountain lions are known uh, as ecosystem engineers. Um, that's kind of a, a fancy scientific term for saying that they positively benefit um, other wildlife and the environment. Um, one example of this is that mountain lion kills. The carcasses can be a source of food for other types of wildlife, like the critically endangered California condor. Um, in fact, um, mountain lions can also kind of exert pressure on deer populations in a positive manner. Um, there's some studies um, out of, I think, Yosemite Valley that show in areas that don't have mountain lions, like Yosemite Valley, there's actually a loss of biodiversity. And they think it's because of essentially overgrazing by deer populations. And then there's like less, um, less space for other species like frogs. Um, and so we're not sure if we lost mountain lions, how exactly that would impact the landscape in central and so or southern California, but we do know that they exert a positive influence and we, it would be very tragic to lose them and would probably have um, what's known as a trophic cascade um, and a negative impact. So, um, and then just as is on the side here, um, if we add more wildlife crossings to our highways and roads, we're going to make people safer too, because um, not just mountain lions, but other species like deer aren't going to um, be, you know, running into a car as much and the, the animals are going to be safer and people. So there's all sorts of reasons we should um, continue to push for listing of mountain lions and for more wildlife crossings. That's really cool that mountain lions benefit frogs. I did not know that. <laughs> I know that like in Yellowstone, when they brought the wolves back, the wolves chased the ungulates away from the creeks and that benefited the frogs and the songbirds that use the riparian vegetation. But I didn't know that was true for mountain lions too. So that's awesome. Exactly, so, it's a pretty similar relationship, yeah. Yeah. Tiffany and I work together, but actually we don't, we haven't worked on a project together. So I, Tiffany, I have no idea what you actually do. Tell us about your wildlife connectivity work and why it's important. And, and also, is it really possible to reconnect wild areas? Because it seems like there's just more and more people and more and more concrete and like, can you actually do it? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, great. I'd be happy to explain that a little more. Um, so first, I just want to give like a pretty quick uh, definition of what wildlife connectivity is. And, you know, wildlife connectivity, habitat connectivity, landscape permeability, those are all kind of used pretty interchangeably. Um, and, and it really comes down to the degree to which the landscape facilitates or impedes the movement of animals or plants. Um, and so sometimes the, there are very like um, 
very literal pathways that like animals can use. So say like salmon going upstream or sometimes elk uh, will, will use very um, defined migratory pathways. Uh, but there's also, um, particularly in California, there's a lot, also a lot of species that just kind of meander and roam to find things that they need. And so really having just more general open space and open and ability to roam is, is, an, is another form of wildlife connectivity. Um, next slide, please. And so it's important for a, a lot of different reasons that kind of have already come up. Um, you know, so for like mountain lions, gene flow is a really big issue. So connectivity for adequate gene flow is really important to keep the genetic health of populations um, good. And then um, it also is important because animals use, might, some animals use different habitats during different parts of their lives. So for example, if we look at some amphibians, some, some frogs and salamanders, they, they breed in water, their eggs are laid in water, um, and then their young live in the water until they metamorphose. And then the juveniles and adults spend most of their time on land. And so it's really important to have connectivity between the aquatic resource and the upland habitat resource. And so that's another reason why connectivity is really important. There's also, you know, the need for access to certain, to all the resources that help them sustain their lives. Um, and it also provides really important resilience to climate change. Um, so as, you know, as habitats start to change, as different things start to change and the landscape starts to change, the wildlife need ways to be able to also adapt to the climate change and adapt to these changes in a way that allows them to move to, through these different areas. And so um, connectivity really helps them um, deal with climate change. And as JP mentioned just now, it's also a public safety issue. So if we have more connectivity, that means there are less animals on our roads and less animals um, where we might hurt them or, um, you know, and it's safer for drivers, right? Especially if it's on roads. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so to answer your question about whether it's actually possible to reconnect wildlands, um, absolutely. Um, and that's a lot of the work that we do is to try to get these areas reconnected um, so that animals can move more freely and so their populations can be more healthy. Um, and we've seen a lot of other states do stuff like this. So states like Arizona and Colorado have built wildlife crossings that have led to animals safely crossing over or under their roads while wildlife vehicle collisions have been reduced to 80 to 96%. So it's actually a win-win situation in a lot of ways. Um, and there are other states like including um, Utah and Washington that are following suit and starting to look at roadkill data and identify hotspots and build wildlife crossings based on those data. But unfortunately, California has a lot of catching up to do because they aren't collecting roadkill data and they aren't really building as many wildlife crossings as they should. Um, so some of the work that we do um, includes pushing for local, county, and state wildlife connectivity legislation that protects remaining nat natural linkages, restores degraded or constrained linkages, and builds wildlife crossings um, to enhance connectivity at known barriers. Um, we also try to make sure that when developers um, conduct their environmental analyses for new projects, that they adequately assess impacts to habitat connectivity and wildlife movement. And we push for those developers to avoid known natural corridors and minimize their impacts to wildlife movement in their project design. Um, and so I just wanted to show you um, a couple of videos about how some animals might use these crossings. And so, I don't know, uh-oh, uh -oh, are the links not going? Yeah, the video links aren't there, but we can, we can put them on Slack tomorrow. Okay, put I'm sorry Slack about on. that. Yeah, oh, bummer. Well, so ju I'll just explain what's happening in this video. It might be difficult to see, but um, so this is a, an undercrossing in Vermont for amphibians and and hopefully you guys can check out the Slack video or when it's on the um, Slack tomorrow because there's just all these like little black spots kind of moving along in one hour. You can see so many different little critters just crossing under this underpass, um, which is super fun. Um, and then next slide. And then uh, hopefully some of you have seen this already, but, but what's great about this, these um, crossings and especially when we can watch and see what, what's happening at them. So there's um, a lot of people are studying some of these culverts and undercrossings. And um, sometimes we document 
some pretty amazing animal behavior. And so this video actually shows a coyote and a badger getting together for their nightly hunt, um, maybe to go get some bulls or some other rodents. And they actually use this culvert to cross um, under a road into some other really um, healthy habitat. So why, I'm why sorry the they, videos don't work. Why do they hang out together? Yeah, so I mean, it's something that's like definitely been seen before, but I think this is the first time we actually, it's been um, shown on video. And, and, and so people think it's because um, the coyotes kind of hunt from above the ground, like higher above the ground. And so they can um, chase the animals when, when the animals are running around scurrying on the top of the ground while the badgers dig um, to get the voles either. So either the badger digs and the, and the rodent comes out and the coyote can catch it more easily or the coyote's on top and he's scaring the um, rodent to go in its burrow and then the badger can get it in its burrow. So it's a pretty fun um, behavior and interaction that I think um, is really greatly captured in this video and I'm, so, I'm sorry it's not working. I'm sorry it's not working to Google coyote badger underpass or something after the <laughs> webinar. You'll be able to find yeah. it and we'll, we'll yeah. share a link too. So sometimes trying to make change at the national level or even the state level can be overwhelming and depressing, but sometimes you can make effective change at the city and county level. So I want, JP, can you share with us about the county level work that you're doing to gain protections for mountain lions? Sure, I'd love to. Um, so yeah, I'd love to chat just a little about our work in Ventura and LA County. Um, and so in Ventura, um, they actually, with support from the center, uh, passed um, a groundbreaking ordinance last year um, for wildlife connectivity. Um, it's the first of its kind ordinance on the county level. Um, and some of the main things it would do would heighten protection for areas designated as important wildlife corridors. Um, and so this doesn't just protect, um, you know, charismatic uh, big species like the mountain lion, it protects um, arroyo toads, which uh, there's a photo of one right there, or bobcats, or the California red-legged frog, which is um, a rare species in Southern California. Um, and so some of the other features of this ordinance is that it um, requires buffer zones around streams. Um, and so this obviously is really important to aquatic and semi-aquatic wildlife like the California red-legged frog. Um, in addition, even for small projects, it requires environmental review um, and mitigation um, if a project has the potential to degrade a corridor. Um, and so we, we were lucky to support um, and offer improvements for this ordinance um, that passed last year. Um, and now, um, unsurprisingly, and I guess a little unfortunately, a few industry groups have filed lawsuits trying to invalidate the ordinance. And we, along with a coalition of other groups, are, um, have intervened in the lawsuit on the side of Ventura County to defend the ordinance. Um, and the, uh, our intervention application was actually just granted, I think, a few weeks ago, which was great. Um, and we're really lucky to work with UCI Laws Environmental Law Clinic on that. So um, we're hopeful others, other counties will um, move in this direction of adopting these types of ordinances. And in the meantime, we're standing by Ventura County to make sure that this ordinance is not thrown out by um, oil and gas and developer interests. Um, next slide, please. So um, in LA County, the story is a little bit different. Um, Ventura County is taking positive steps to strengthen wildlife connectivity. Unfortunately, LA County is in some ways going in the opposite direction. Um, LA County's Board of Supervisors has approved two major sprawl projects in wildlife corridors over the last year or two. Um, and one of them is the 12,000 acre Centennial Developments. Um, you can see a photo of the sites um, right there, actually two photos. Um, and you know, with that, with that development, part of the reason we got involved is it is in a critical corridor between or linkage between the Southern California mountain ranges and the Southern Sierra Nevada. Um, so that whole area is really important for even statewide connectivity for species like the mountain lion. Um, and that study, um, those like, 10 populations we talked about earlier, essentially that area um, is part of the linkage that connects all the Southern California mountain lions to the more genetically diverse ones in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and so we're, we're in court right now um, 
trying seeking to invalidate the approvals of that project because of its impacts on mountain lions, but also because of its impacts on native grasslands, wildflowers, wild, excuse me, wildflowers. You can see in the pictures, it's a, it's a beautiful area. It deserves protection, not um, housing development in that area. Um, it's a similar story with the, the 1300 acre North Lake development. That's another large development that we're in litigation challenging. Um, that one would, would block movement from mountain lions, but also evict one of the last remaining populations of the Western Spadefoot toad from Southern California. So we actually are in trial with both of those cases now, and we're hopeful we can limit those developments um, so they do not have such significant impacts on connectivity and wildlife, and we'll continue um, to move that fight forward. I knew we were gonna talk a lot about mountain lions, but I had no idea we were gonna talk about amphibians so much tonight and it <laughs> makes my heart really happy. <laughs> we mentioned like 10 or 12 different uh, amphibian species. Um, we both, so, Tiffany, yeah, and, Tiffany and I both love amphibians. <laughs> Me too, <I> frogs. <laughs> um, so <laughs> developing in wildlife habitat is dangerous for the wildlife, but it can also be dangerous for people Tiffany, can you talk to us about your work to halt development in fire zones and why this is so important? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, so I think it's important to know that, you know, 95% of wildfires in California are caused by people, mostly in the urban wildlife interface by things like power lines, electrical equipment, car sparks, gender reveal parties with fireworks, you know. Um, and so this means that while climate change plays a role in these fires, we can't ignore that our land use practices are also large drivers of these wildfires and their impacts to people, property, and, and wildlife. Um, so placing new developments in high fire prone areas actually increases the risk of a fire being ignited. And so even though wildfires are a natural and necessary process in many of California's native ecosystems, as humans ignite more fires more often in native shrublands in the urban wildland interface, these habitats are replaced by non-native grasses and forbs that burn more frequently and more easily. And so that leads to a feedback loop that eliminates native habitats and biodiversity while increasing fire threat over time. And the thing is, not only does sprawl development increase fire risk, but it also further fragments the landscape. And so it cuts off escape routes for animals seeking refuge from the fires. And, and sadly, we do see this come into play sometimes, um, particularly with larger wide ranging animals like mountain lions and bears, um, where they are often injured or they can even be killed in these fires. Um, so we're working to limit new development in these high fire prone habitats with the ultimate goal of keeping both people and wildlife safe. And so as JP mentioned, um, we're with the North Lake and the Centennial projects, we're, we're fighting those projects because of their impacts on mountain lions and other sensitive species um, and connectivity, but also because they're both located in really high fire prone areas where fires have burned before and will likely burn again. Um, and we recently just filed a lawsuit for the Gwinnett Valley project in Lake County. Um, and it would be this luxury mega resort in an area that has repeatedly burned, um, including in this year's LNU lightning complex fire. And, and they don't provide adequate evacuation plans if a fire should occur. And so, um, you know, there, there are all these other, and, and that project is important for wildlife connectivity and climate change resilience. You know, so, so uh, there is a lot of intersectionality with this and, and the work that we do. Um, but, um, and so, and yeah, so that's some of the stuff that we're doing. So you guys have mentioned a couple of the individual projects that you're fighting it seems like there would be no end to each individual development you could take on and each one of them has got to be incredibly time consuming. So how do you prioritize which projects you work on? JP? Wanna... Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It, it is a difficult process. Um, you know, we have pretty limited resources and staff, so we are very selective in which projects we decide to um, campaign against and which we decide to file lawsuits against. Um, I guess if, if there was a theme, it's very large projects that will degrade wildlife connectivity or destroy habitat for rare or endangered species. Um, for instance, with that Centennial project we both mentioned, it's uh, proposed at 12,000 acres. Um, 
the, the entire city of San Francisco is 30,000 acres. So we're talking about a development more than a third, almost over a third the size of San Francisco, which you know is very big. Um, at the same time, we're trying to push for policies so that there's less of a likelihood of these types of projects being proposed in the first place. I'm so glad that you're doing the work that you're doing. Um, it's been like a really heavy year and we often hear that our webinars can be depressing because the problems we face are so depressing. The extinction crisis, the climate emergency, plastic pollution, it's all overwhelming. Um, so I was wondering if you have any good news you want to share with us or any re recent victories you want to tell us about. Sure. Um, so we, we've been in litigation the last few years challenging a project that would have blocked connectivity for the Santa Ana mountain lines. Um, and that's one of those populations that's doing um, not too well right now due to the connectivity issues. But um, in March, we received a very favorable ruling from the court agreeing that the city and the developer had violated state law and the project did not adequately mitigate impacts on mountain lines. So since March, we've been in negotiations with the developer and the city to downsize the project and limit impacts on mountain lines. And we expect to be able to finalize an agreement very soon on this. So we're really happy we were able to use the litigation process to obtain a positive outcome for local mountain lines. That's awesome. Um, Tiffany, tell us some of your good news or recent victories. Sure, yeah. Well, so one of the things is something that JP talked about earlier, but I just want to reiterate it because it's pretty exciting. Um, and that is that uh, we, in April of this year, we um, were able to attain candidacy, candidacy status for mountain lions in Southern California and along the Central Coast under the California Endangered Species Act. And so that was um, really exciting. And it makes me really hopeful that we can save these populations from becoming locally extinct. Because um, again, as JP mentioned, there was so much support from a broad um, spectrum of coalition members. and. Um, and from support from the Fish and Game Commission. And so I think that was a really awesome win. Um, and then, you know, one thing that we do a lot is um, we work with a lot of different allies. And so, um, you know, we also support a lot of projects um, that we feel are strong. And so we've supported and continue to support efforts to restore an undercrossing um, in the Santa Anas, which would connect, which um, would better connect the Santa Ana population with mountain lions in the Eastern Peninsula range. Um, and we just found out that that project will likely receive funding and start, and the restorations work will probably start in 2021. And so that's really exciting too. That's very exciting because if we're going to save life on earth and call for a thousand underpasses, that's one. So you at home, go get 999 more. <laughs> Everything will be safe. Yes, please. <laughs> Speaking of people at home, how can our members help with this work? Yeah, well, um, if you live in California, um, we do have an action alert right now um, where you can send it to your state representative to put pressure on them to prioritize wildlife connectivity and mountain lion conservation. We'll also likely have more action alerts in the coming months regarding specific policies we support, as well as closer to the final vote on the mountain lion listing next year. Yeah, and some of the things that I think um, would be really great that folks can do is if, you know, if you're passionate about something and you want to investigate a little bit more into it or you want to let people know about it, I think iNaturalist is a really awesome platform and tool um, where you can learn a lot, but then also provide a lot for other people to learn. I think it's, um, you know, if you see species that you think are interesting or you want to take a picture of safely, um, and upload it to iNaturalist. Sometimes that's ways that scientists, that biologists find out that, oh my gosh, that species still occurs here. That's really great. I thought it, it had disappeared from that landscape, um, but it's so great to know that it's back. And some, some, sometimes that's on iNaturalist, sometimes it's on Instagram. It's pretty amazing. Um, and you know, and like I mentioned that um, project in the Santa Cruz mountains was started by a very enthusiastic iNaturalist um, member. And she really, her name is Ann Parsons and she really kickstarted um, like a deep dive into helping those animals. And so, you know, I think there are definitely lots of ways that um, you can, you can kind of make an impact. And then also, um, you know, when I mentioned that UC Davis study and 
that UC Davis actually has um, a website where you can report roadkill. And that actually helps with wildlife connectivity and, and, and identifying where, where are animals moving and where are they getting hit? Because maybe that's where we need to put a wildlife crossing. And so um, I think there will be providing, yep. And so that website was also provided. So um, feel free, again, please, if you do want to take pictures of roadkill though, please be very safe about it um, because it's often um, not in places that you want to stop. Um, while cars are whizzing by, so. Yeah, oops, that's not the right slide. Let's just stop sharing. <laughs> um, so in the email you're gonna get after the webinar, we were gonna send, cause this is about California mountain lions, we were gonna ask all of you to help take this action alert to help get more underpasses in California, but then we realized you have to be in California to respond to this action alert. So the email is actually going to have a link asking you to support roadless areas. And you're like, we're talking about connectivity. Why support roadless areas? But if we don't build the roads in the first place, then we don't have to build underpasses and overpasses. So if you live in California, you want to take that action alert, we'll give you the link or you can go to our website under action and you'll see it there. And the rest of you, everybody else will get a link asking you to support roadless areas. So now we're going to take your questions um, some people emailed questions in early. One of them, are mountain lions still killed in California to protect livestock? And I actually had a question about this too. Is anybody opposing the state protection for mountain lions? You Those are great questions. <laughs> Steve, Tiffany, do you wanna? Sure, yeah, I can, I can take a stab at that first. Um, okay. So are mountain lions being killed in California? So the populations that now have provisional protection under the California Endangered Species Act, it is now um, very difficult, if not impossible, to get a permit to lethally take or to kill a mountain lion, which is a huge improvement. Um, and so essentially, um, if, for instance, a mountain lion attacks livestock, the livestock owner has to first show that they properly enclosed the, um, you know, the cow at night and went through a lot of steps um, and so I think um, fu functionally, it's now impossible to get a permit to lethally kill one of these protected mountain lions, um, which again is a, is a huge benefit, I think. Um, as far as like who opposes this, um, California Farm Bureau um, is not happy about this because you know, it, it, it makes it harder for them to kill mountain lions that they don't like. And that's, you know, that's their position, that's fine, but we, we think local native wildlife should take precedence in such situations. Thanks, JP. Um, this is a great question. I was wondering about this too. Do mountain lions automatically know to take the underpass or the overpass or other wildlife or do they still cross the road? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And that's definitely something that is constantly being looked at um, and developed. But really uh, what it comes down to is uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that is involved with the crossing. That's not just a tunnel or just a bridge. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's ex wildlife exclusion fencing, like along a freeway that kind of guides the animals to where there are um, entrances to wildlife crossings for them to use. And so that goes for mountain lions. Um, it has, it's something like, uh, I think, 10 foot fencing. And then it also has to go underground for any burrowing or digging animals that might try to go in under and then they get trapped on the road. And so, um, and then, and then there are specific ones for, you know, different animals have different needs and, and behaviors, right? And so for amphibians, for a lot of salamanders, the, the walls are much smaller and they're curved so that they can't climb over them and so that it funnels them to the tunnels. Um, and, and yeah, and so, you know, there's, there's definitely when you're building a wild, or like when a wildlife crossing goes, is constructed, you really need to consider what are your target species? What animals are we trying to get um, across on the other side of the road? Um, and so, yeah. And then also with the with the fencing and stuff, sometimes, you know, deer or bobcats or mountain lions can still get on the road. And if they do, there are jump outs. So there are safety measures for them to be able to get off that road again. Um, but but really in terms of like for those wildlife crossings, we, we do kind of need to figure out a way to guide them to those, um, to the entrances and also, you know, there's a lot of things that affect whether or not an animal is even going to approach the road. Um, and so, you know, it might be 
physically they're just cars kind of in the way but also there's a lot of noise when it comes to traffic and there's a lot of lights at night that maybe animals don't want to be around or lighting from the street and so at those entrances where we have crossings it's really important to make sure that you know the lighting isn't directed right at the entrance and that you know, maybe we have sound burns up so it's not as loud either right next to that tunnel or even inside the tunnel um, because there are lots of other things that might prevent animals from, from actually moving into those tunnels and using them. Thanks, Tiffany. I was actually just reading about this for monarch butterflies because the monarchs are, the eastern monarchs are migrating to Mexico right now and millions of them get killed on the highways on their way there. And one of the things they're doing to try to recover populations is planting milkweed and flowers along interstate highways. And how do you not just plant flowers and then the butterflies get creamed? And so I was reading that you can install really high netting to force the butterflies to fly up so that they fly over the traffic. And I hope that's part of the plan. <laughs> but I hadn't yeah. really thought about like roadkill it affects everything, butterflies, toads, mountain lions. Um, yeah. You showed those really sad kinked tails. Um, there's a question, is there captive breeding to try to get more mountain lion genetic diversity or could you just introduce mountain lions from other populations? I don't know, you to Tiffany. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're probably for this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really great question. And, um, and it's definitely something that's come up a lot in this mountain lion work because their genetic health in some of these populations are just so poor. Um, and um, I personally am not aware of captive um, breeding to help improve um, the wild population's genetic health. Um, but in terms of your question regarding introducing um, animals from other populations, um, that's definitely something that's been discussed and um, potentially considered down the road. Um, but, it's, but ultimately it's not really a sustainable solution you know, even if you if you if you move a mountain lion um, into the Santa Monica population, like will it be able to? There's still a, a social structure that these animals have, and so will it be able to establish itself? And will it even be able to mate, or will um, it be killed right away by um, by a territorial male? Um, and so there and there's a lot of effort in capturing a mountain lion, a wild mountain lion, and then releasing it somewhere else, and then it might not even be successful. Um, in, in introducing genes. And so really the, um, the solution here is connectivity, is just really improving connectivity between those populations that are really isolated. Um, and even within the, the, like the Santa Monica population is already so small and, and it's such as an island, a fragment of habitat. Um, so we really need to connect that with other um, mountain lions up the coast um, and even in the, if possible in the Santa Ana's and the San Gabriel's um, because that we just, we need more gene flow. Um, but I will say to that, sorry, this is a very long-winded question or a long-winded answer, but um, there has been, you know, with the Florida Panthers, which is the uh, wonderful painting we saw earlier, you know, they were, they were, they're endangered and they were doing really poorly. They were having heart issues and reproductive issues. And we like, we thought they were going to go extinct. And so the last ditch effort was to, introduce Texas pumas into that population. Um, and that allowed for some genetic recovery. And so now the Florida Panthers are healthier. They're, I think their numbers were extremely low and now they're somewhere in the hundreds. So they're, doing, they're still struggling, but they're doing a lot better now because of that genetic introduction. Um, but really, again, I think, you know, um, the really more sustainable and, and most important thing we can do is improve connectivity so they can mix together on their own. Thanks, Tiffany. There's a very specific question. I don't know if you guys will know the answer, but two people ask, so I'm going to bump it up. What is the current status of the US 101 wildlife overpass at Liberty Sin Road? And are there plans for other wildlife crossings? Yeah, um, so that has been approved by Caltrans um, and National Wildlife Federation has been working on that for quite a while to get that moving forward. So that's very positive. Um, the kind of remaining issue is that it is not fully funded. I think there's still a pretty significant funding shortfall. Um, and so, well, it's, it would be ready to break ground, I think as early as next year, it really depends upon funding becoming available. 
Um, and our view is that um, the state of California, local agencies should all be partners in making sure that crossing and other crossings get built sooner than later because especially with the Santa Monica mountain lions, they are already evidencing inbreeding depression in some ways with the kink tails and we need the crossings now. Thanks, JP. So for people at home who want to help with wildlife corridor work, if they don't live in California, um, if they wanna approach their city council or their county, what advice do you have for them? And are there groups that they could work with that could help them do this so they're not just flying solo? Um, I, I can go first. I guess yeah. for people in California, I mean, we uh, in the Urban Wildlands Program are very active in California. The center um, has staff all throughout the country working on these issues. So um, definitely get in touch with us um, if you have questions and we could perhaps connect you to other staff members at the center. There are other groups um, working on connectivity issues like for instance, in the Pacific Northwest, there's the Wildlands Network. Um, yeah, and I don't know, Tiffany, if you have anything you wanna add to that. Yeah, no, that was great. I, I was gonna mention the Wildlands Network too. They're up in the Pacific Northwest, but they they do a lot of national work too. So there was recently a while, um, I might get the name of this wrong, but it, it was like a Federal Wildlife Corridors Act. Um, and so that's something that folks can look into. Um, and I think Wildlands Network was a, a really big um, part of that. And um, Defenders of Wildlife also work with uh, connectivity for Florida Panthers out in Florida. Um, and so um, those were just a couple of the organizations that came to mind outside of California. Um, but they're also, you know, I mean, just another plug for the herps, kind of what um, Tierra had mentioned before um, when, you know, talking about helping frogs cross the road um, using the bucket brigades. There are actually a lot of groups that do that um, throughout the US a lot. Um, in the, the ones that I know of are kind of in the Northeast, but like, um, you know, there, there are definitely lots of groups that are enthusiastic about it that, um, that go out and have volunteers to, to help these little critters get to their breeding spots, so. Thanks, Tiffany. So there's a question about if the mountain lion, well, I, I guess it's already got protection under CESA as a candidate, would that do anything about pre-existing freeways that cut off its migration dispersal? Um, yeah, I, I, can, I can try to answer that. Um, so with freeways that have already been approved, it wouldn't immediately require um, any crossing infrastructure. However, um, where it would trigger requirement likely for new infrastructure is if there's any modifications to those freeways. For instance, the Highway 101 in Southern California, I think there's already some plans to expand it even further. Um, and you know, if there's a project like that, then it would require essentially give a legal mandate to Caltrans to ensure that they're not um, harming mountain lions or impeding connectivity. And so obviously one of the main ways they can do that is by building wildlife crossings or by, um, for instance, making culverts or underpasses uh, more friendly to wildlife through native vegetation, soundproofing. Um, and so this, well, there, you know, there is damage that has been done, it, it can be slowly undone through um, crossings. Um, in addition, uh, with the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, we'll put together a recovery plan, which will help identify where we need crossings. Um, and so there will be kind of a, a forward looking process as well to help undo the damage that's already been done. There's a question about how much the underpasses or overpasses the crossings, how much they cost and like where the funding comes from and if fundraising could help support getting more of them. Um, Tiffany, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Sure, I can take it part of it and then see if okay. you need to add Sounds anything. Good. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so it kind of varies uh, how much the crossings cost. Like the, the, the Liberty Canyon crossing on the 101 in SoCal, um, I think is upwards of $87 million or something like that. Is that right, JP? $87 million? Well, I think it's $87 million. Um, and uh, they, it's, but that's like a really big, it'd be, it'd be the biggest crossing in, I think in the world um, over, over crossing, it goes over so many, like 10 lanes of freeway, I think. 
Um, and it's a retrofit. And I think, so that's kind of what makes it expensive is that, you know, it's that the freeway is already there and they have to figure out a way to get this huge patch of habitat to go over um, the freeway. Um, but there are a lot of smaller projects that might cost much less. So, um, you know, I think if my memory serves me correctly, the, in Washington state, they're doing um, overpasses and underpasses at, um, on the, along the I-90 in between the North and South Cascades Mountains. And, um, you know, so some of, there's an overpass that, that is almost completed. It might be completed already. And, you know, that was, lar that was a small piece of a much larger project where they were like basically maintaining and updating um, a huge part of the freeway. But that crossing was six million dollars, so not nothing, but uh, much less than that eighty-seven million. And then again, you know, when there are culverts that are already being that are already there and just need to be upgraded in size, or maybe they need to change the lighting or the sound berms or something, or like um, even just maintain the vegetation outside the culverts, um, that can be much less expensive. Um, in terms of where does the funding come from, that's a really really great question. We think it should come from the state. Um, and, and, and local and regional agencies, um, but that is not always the case. And that's why things like Liberty Canyon are getting our, our fundraising um, so that that crossing can get built. And so I guess that's a long way of saying is that it's a mix of things. There's, it's a mix of um, sources of funding, um, but really our hope is that, you know, we can get a more solid um, funding situation from the state. JP, do you want to add anything? Yeah, just um, that, you know, wildlife crossings can be expensive. They're a lot less expensive if they're incorporated into the planning process when a highway is being built. But even to, you know, retrofit existing highways, um, the way I see it is that it's as an investment in not just wildlife, but people as well. Um, as Tiffany was mentioning earlier, um, vehicle wildlife collisions cost, I think, around 600, up to $600 million a year in California. And so states that have implemented wildlife crossings and invested in them have seen dramatic reductions in these collisions, which are, you know, bad for people and wildlife. And so, you know, it's something California as the fifth largest economy on earth can and should um, step up and start to, um, you know, be more proactive about. And we're hoping the CESA listing of mountain mines will be an uh, impetus towards that um, in the near future. JP, that's actually a question somebody asked. Why do poor countries have more wildlife corridors than California, which has like the fourth or fifth richest economy on earth? That's, that's a, a great question. Why question? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I wish I had the answer and hopefully that will change. Here's kind of a specific question. How do you determine where wildlife crossings need to be? Is it based on camera trapping data or how do you figure out the best place to put them? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and, and it is, part of it is with camera trap data, looking at where animals are already crossing. And a lot of it has to do with roadkill data. So unfortunately in California, we don't collect roadkill data at the state level, um, but UC Davis has that um, community science project where they have folks um, uploading where they, where they find roadkill. Um, but that, but if, you, when you, if, if we were to systematically collect roadkill data, we could then identify where are animals getting hit the most and why, you know? And so um, sometimes it's, oh, there's a creek right under this area. Maybe we need to make this, an, make an underpass here instead so that these animals can cross more safely under the road. Um, and so it's kind of a mix of things um, and it really depends on, you know, what the resources are to be able to investigate um, those, those issues. And so, um, even with like the, the, the newts at, at, at Lexington Reservoir that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, that was a community science project, but now there are other people that are investigating to see, you know, what are the impacts to the population there and, and do, do we need to do something, which I think is pretty clear, but you know, they're gonna, they're still gonna look at that study to see. So, so it, it's a mix. Um, uh, I hope that answers your question. We're almost out of time, but real quickly, do you want to talk about the Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act? Are we supporting that? Yeah, so that so uh, yeah, so that's the federal um, that's the federal act that that I had mentioned earlier that I got the name wrong. So thank you for bringing that up and um, correcting me. But uh, yeah, and we de we definitely support it. We think um, you know that 
it's a really good step in the right direction to improving connectivity throughout, throughout the US. Um, there's definitely lots of work still to be done um, and, and how that plays out um, will be really important. And so, um, and so yeah, but we're, we're excited that, that it's, it's moving forward. Well, we're out of time, but thanks JP and Tiffany for talking to us tonight. And thanks Karina behind the scenes for making this happen. And thanks to you at home for joining us. Next week, we're gonna talk about Africa with our international program. We're gonna talk about leopards and pangolins and giraffes and sea cucumbers. So you're not gonna to wanna to miss that. Um, you're gonna get an email right after this with an action alert link. If you live in California, go to our website to find that specific action alert. We'll be on Slack tomorrow. I won't be, but JP and Tiffany will be from 12 to one. And thanks again. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thank you.